Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Merit Jano, uh, Dean of uh, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. And it's my real privilege uh, to be having this conversation with you this afternoon with two remarkable policy experts and leaders at this crucial historic time in the United States. With me is Jacob Liu, who was, uh, as you all know, Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, he served in that uh, position from 2013 until 2017. But previously, he served as White House Chief of Staff. He was also Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, in fact, twice, I believe. Uh, he served uh, in the State Department, was uh, senior leadership positions at uh, Citigroup, also was chief operating officer at uh, NYU. So an extraordinary career spanning uh, academia, including now a professor at SIPA. We're honored to have you with us uh, at SIPA. And uh, importantly for this conversation, just extraordinary experience in the executive branch as White House chief of staff and as treasury secretary. Also with us is Josh Bolton, who is president and CEO of the Business Roundtable. Uh, as you know, the BRT is an association of CEOs of leading U.S. companies. Prior to that, he was managing director of an advisory firm that he co-founded, and he spent two years as a visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. So he too has deep ties with academia and I believe serves on the Princeton board or has for some time. Um, importantly, he spent 20 years of government uh, in government, including eight years in the White House under President George W. Bush as Chief of Staff, also as Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and as Deputy Chief of Staff. And before that, he was Policy Director in the Bush 2000 presidential campaign, and earlier in his career uh, was in the executive branch at USTR, and had a period in the private sector at Goldman Sachs and at O'Melveny and Myers. Uh, Josh and Jack, may I say, I'm really privileged to have you with us to have this conversation today. I thought we might uh, start off um, uh, talking about uh, managing in the interregnum after an election and uh, uh, during the transition and the early days and if I may, could I invite you each to talk about what is supposed to happen? What is, is there such a thing as a, a you know, typical uh, features of the period between an election and an inauguration? And also about your own experiences. May I invite Jack to lead us off? Thanks very much, uh, Merritt. It's good to see you, Josh. Um, I think that one of the great uh, features of American democracy is that from the very beginning, the idea of orderly and peaceful transition, regardless of policy, po politics, party, has just been baked into the system. Um, obviously, George Washington set the tone famously for leaving in a way that he didn't have to. Uh, he could have run for a third term, but he wanted to demonstrate that leadership in a democracy rotates. It's gotten much more formal over the years, even in the time that I was in government from coming into the Clinton administration in 1992 to leaving the Obama administration in 2017, there, it went from being a very informal set of uh, approaches, understandings, relationships to a quite formalized one, including statutory offices and federal funding even before the election. Um, the consistent theme throughout was the, the absolute necessity for both the senior political leadership and for policymakers at all levels to hand over the baton in an orderly way. Just a couple of, of you know, stories. Um, you know, this is not the first moment in our history when there have been questions about the outcomes of elections. We've always gotten through it in an orderly way. In fact, I think there's less of a question now than in uh, recent history, you know, when, when I was leaving the Clinton administration and Josh was coming in to the Bush administration, it took a month after the election for the Supreme Court to resolve the outcome. In the month before the, from the election to the Supreme Court decision, it was that informal process that remained in gear with people preparing briefing books and getting ready 
and not knowing whether they were going to need to use them or not. Literally, the day the Supreme Court ruled, I remember sitting at my conference table in the old executive office building with a half a dozen senior budget policy advisors to the incoming president um, who now had half the time for a transition. And I remember saying to them, you know, there's an office right down the hall from me. It's yours. You can use it. It wasn't required by law to do that at the time. Now it's required by law. Um, and the staff of OMB is fully available to you. Here are the briefing books, use them or not. Here's the baseline we prepared, use it or not. And um, I said, I'll only give you one you know, condition. One is anything that the staff is doing for me is between them and me. Anything the staff is doing for you is between them and you. And these are people I care about and you're gonna to grow to care about. You can't kill them in the process. They have to come out the other end and you need them to come out the other end. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone honored their part of the agreement. I didn't agree with the policy being made down the hall. They didn't agree with the policy being made up the hall. And it was an orderly transition. I mean, I have to say that the story of that transition was marred by a prank, the removal of a key on a keyboard, the W key on a typewriter. And it came to kind of symbolize, you know, an ungenerous kind of transition when in fact, what I did at OMB was what the president and the chief of staff had told every agency to do with the incoming administration. And uh, I think it's a lesson that you have to do these things in a way that both works and appears to work. And you have to tell people in the organization, no pranks, nothing that is going to tell a story that is other than the story that is the right one, which is we hand over power in a peaceful way. And I'll hand it over to Josh now, but just say that he set the tone in the transition from President Bush to President Obama in an extraordinarily powerful way one that was remembered for eight years in the Obama administration is kind of writing the book for how to do it. Uh, because everyone came in feeling that they had what they needed, they were treated with respect and courtesy. And it's hard, and even if you do it extremely well, everybody leaves, everybody comes. But um, it was done with that same kind of grace. Thank you very much. Josh, you were, you were there to receive that uh, incoming experience, as well as uh, uh, just spoken of in outgoing. But what is your sense of what the process is supposed to be, uh, as well as your own experience? Um, <clears throat> well, first, Merritt, thank you for the opportunity to be with you and uh, for the audience to know. Merritt and I were colleagues uh, now 30 years ago at the uh, at the U.S. Trade Representative's office, and it, it's it's a privilege to be on a program that you're hosting and a, and a particularly big privilege to be with my friend, Jack Liu, who, uh, who really is one of the, uh, the finest public servants of our age. And, uh, and, you, and you just heard why, which is that uh, he, he reflects a caring, he's, he's got a partisan point of view, trust me. Um, but he reflects a caring about the country that, uh, that we, like to see in all of our public servants, and uh, Jack is among the best. Um, <clears throat> I was on the uh, I was on the receiving end of the um, of the of the uh, Clinton to Bush transition. It 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 was a it was a peculiar one, um, but it actually happened even roughly the way it, it at the time it was supposed to happen which was that the, as a matter of, of grace and dignity and caring about the country, the outgoing administration uh, were actually uh, very cooperative with the, with the incoming Bush administration. Um, a lot of that has now been codified into law. There was a, uh, there was a transition act adopted in, I think, 2010 um, that now puts a requirement on the outgoing administration to make a uh, make money available, make space available, allow the um, the incoming team to uh, put what are called landing teams into each of the agencies. That's what Jack was just describing: was the 
OMB landing team that I, Jack, I wasn't aware that they landed in your office the day <laughs> of the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court ruling, but I'm, but I'm not surprised because um, uh, <clears throat> that's where, that's, that's one of the hardest areas of transition, which is to take in midstream to take over a, what at the time was, I guess, about a three plus trillion dollar budget is now a four and a half trillion dollar budget. Um, but uh, Jack was known to be careful with the public purse. And, and so it was only three trillion at the time. Uh, but uh, that was one of the areas where uh, as the incoming Bush administration, we really, we really felt we, were, we had a problem because we had only half the normal transition. And, um, uh, and so there was a lot of work to do, a lot of, a lot of things to get hands around. And uh, Jack and team were very, uh, were very gracious and cooperative not because they supported our agenda, as, as Jack just said, but um, because it was important that the, the country be, be run competently. And so that's what people have come to expect uh, over, the, over the course of years. Um, you also expect the occasional prank, um, like the, the removal of the, uh, of the W from the keyboards. Um, uh, which actually, when I got to my desk, I, my keyboard did have a W on it. The prank that I was a victim of was that uh, my phone had been forwarded somewhere else. <laughs> so, that, so that, and I, and I did not know how to unforward it. <laughs> so, so my phone calls were, were going someplace else. But, but let At me say- At least you had a phone, Josh, in the Clinton <laughs> transition and we didn't have phones. No phone, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No phones, uh, but uh, but I should say something about that because there there were a couple of pranks which uh, which some they were they were kind of funny but um, but definitely not the right tone to set. And the the interesting thing is that the press was all over those pranks because they they wanted to write a story about the tension. Uh, and the, uh, the Bush White House unsuccessfully tried to suppress that story, tried to downplay it because we had been treated well on the way in. And, uh, you know, a couple of kids playing a prank um, should not have been, been allowed to ruin it. Uh, and from a substantive standpoint, uh, they didn't. But that's what uh, the kind of transition that Jack led at OMB and the Clinton administration led um, even before the statute is what the American people have come to accept, even when there's, there's a bitterness between the outgoing and the incoming. Um, and uh, it's, it's what I think the American people should, uh, should insist on going forward. Interestingly, it's sometimes also a time when the sitting president, you know, tries to maximize his influence over some issues uh, 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 that that he cares about, um, and also where you know presidents not uncommonly pardon people uh, or take other actions, you know, during that uh, interregnum period. So do you think it's typical for a president to try to also push their policy into whatever form they think will give it more durability uh, or make it harder for the next incoming to unravel? I wonder if you might comment on, on that dimension. Well, for, you know, I, I don't, I, I can speak for two end of term experiences. There's a, after eight years, a lot of work that's almost done. And there's, a, you feel a sense of urgency to finish things that you've been working on. It's almost impossible in the last two months of an administration to gin up a lot of new things. So the idea that on the eve of a handover, you're doing things that are kind of new is a little bit exaggerated. I can tell you that when we were finishing up in the, in the Clinton administration, this is gonna sound a little old fashioned, um, we had a lot of rulemakings that were almost done. And in those days, you had to print in the federal register 
hand setting a lot of things. And there were a limited number of pages they could set a day. And we ended up with the limiting factor being how many pages could the Federal Register print? And we had a meeting every few days where the chief of staff, the director of OMB, and the head of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs went through the half a dozen or a dozen priorities and the number of pages to figure out the way to maximize the ability to finish our work in the last month. That, that's the kind of stuff that I'm familiar with at the end of the term. It's not trying to lock in place new things that you haven't thought of. I frankly think that it's almost impossible to do that effectively because to build a record that will withstand scrutiny and legal challenge, it's too late to start in November if you want to have major policy made uh, in a rulemaking by uh, a transition. Um, personnel, you know, there's a history of, you know, some administrations more than others burrowing in and putting political people into places where they can stay on. Um, I frankly didn't experience an awful lot of that on either end, um, you know, coming in or going out a little bit, uh, but, but, you know, nothing that, that struck me as being um, uh, remarkable. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would be a problem if uh, an outgoing administration were to not leave the system functioning for the incoming administration. So you can't break it on the way out. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's what, what has been kind of consistently done, maximizing, in, in my experience, maximizing what you do in your term and handing over you know, as close to a well-oiled machine as you can make our complicated federal system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just uh, Merritt, just to echo uh, what Jack said. Um, yeah, I think the, the concerns about midnight regulations and so on are, um, that it's, it's, it's a legitimate concern, but it's overblown because um, the stuff that's really hard for the next administration to undo when they walk through the door is stuff that takes months and sometimes years to put in place. So it's not, uh, it, it, most of what I've experienced was not last minute stink bombs placed by the outgoing administration, but stuff where they are trying to lock in as much of the agenda that, as, that they've been working on for years as they can. And as the incoming Bush administration, for Clinton and, and I'm sure the incoming Obama administration after Bush, uh, one of the early priorities for the transition team and for the first team is, okay, what do we need to undo uh, as rapidly as possible? I think, I think a fair amount of that is going on, but I, but I don't think people should view it as, um, as contrary to the to legitimate rules of the game. There, there is some, there, there's inevitably some, um, disreputable behavior, um, but in my experience, it's fairly limited. I, I wanna say one other thing though, that neither Jack nor I have mentioned about the transition, uh, and it was a, a message underscored uh, to me by John Podesta, who was chief of staff at the time the uh, Clinton administration was outgoing and Jack was budget director. Um, and the message is, only one president at a time. And, and that needs to be communicated very clearly to the folks who are coming in um, that they, you know, they, if it's properly run, they get to have, they get to get as, as good a running start as they can, but um, the starter's gun does not go off until noon on January 20 for them. And there were a couple of times when, uh, when, John Podesta had to, had to remind us of that because it's easy for the incoming folks to forget that they don't actually have their hands on the steering wheel until noon on January 20th. Mm -hmm. so on that point, I'd say that I think that's totally right. And I, I remember those conversations. Um, at a moment of crisis, like uh, when Obama came in, there was a certain blending of the teams at the very beginning because you had people who'd been working together, Hank Paulson and Tim Geithner, had been in the trenches you know, for a year before. Um, you know, one could argue that this is a moment that calls for that kind of collaboration because it's a moment of crisis. Whether we'll see it or not, I don't know. But I think the, there's only one president at a time. I mean, I'm 
you know, very proud of the fact that, you know, I worked for a president who as a candidate supported a very unpopular piece of legislation for the outgoing president's you know, program, you know, to help you know, save our financial system. That was during the campaign, you know, and um, we're not seeing a lot of that these days. I don't know that we will. Um, I don't know if that can work in either direction right now, but it would be a good thing if you saw that again. So what happens if the uh, outgoing doesn't cooperate? Uh, and, uh, you know, that's every indication right now is, uh, you know, uh, President Trump has not accepted the electoral outcome. Uh, I understand that President Bush uh, has uh, even uh, this weekend uh, stated the American people can have confidence that this election was fundamentally fair and recognized uh, President Trump's right uh, to call for recounts if, if he, if he uh, sees it uh, as, as necessary, but recognize that outcome as has your own organization, I think, Josh, uh, Business Roundtable. But you know, if, if the Trump administration uh, refuses to cooperate, what, is, what does that mean uh, from, from the point of view of, of the transition? Um, Merritt, let, let me take, uh, take the first crack at, at this um, because you've, you've, you've brought up the, the Bush transition and, um, and President Bush did speak out over the weekend. Yes. Uh, with compliments for the Trump team of having run a tough race, but basically saying, uh, yeah, it's perfectly legit to pursue these other avenues, but it's quite clear that it's over. At least there's no indication at this point that, uh, that any of the avenues that are open to the president would alter the outcome of the election and uh, it's time to move forward. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm proud that, of the statement that President Bush made and proud of the statement that along similar lines that the Business Roundtable made. Um, I've had a few, few people say to me, well, that's hypocritical that Bush fought for a month, um, but it was, it was very different circumstances because uh, the election hinged on one state that uh, that the, the final, that the, that the preliminary count from that state had President Bush winning by a grand total of 537 votes out of more than 6 million cast. And, uh, and the and President Bush's opponent, uh, Vice President Gore, set about challenging that result and demanding recounts. And there was, there was a lot of litigation back and forth about um, which, which, if any, votes to recount and so on, ultimately settled by the, by the Supreme Court. So it, it really was in doubt for a, uh, for a full month. And what Jack described really was happening, which is both teams were starting to gear up, genuinely not knowing who was going to uh, ultimately be declared the president when the electoral college got together. So uh, a, a, a different kind of circumstance um, back then in, in 2000 than, uh, than the one that we're presumably facing today. Um, as, to, as to the question, what happens if a president doesn't cooperate? I, uh, I don't think there's any precedent for that. There, there have been presidents who were you know, really mad and bitter on the way out the door. Uh, you know, John Adams famously left Washington before Thomas Jefferson arrived to be inaugurated. Um, and uh, uh, Herbert Hoover uh, reportedly uh, stayed for the inaugural, but didn't speak to Roosevelt on the, on the ride up to the Capitol. Um, but even, even in those circumstances, um, government was very different. Uh, we have not had examples of uh, presidents intentionally trying to sabotage the, the transition to a new government. And I don't think we'll see it today. I mean, I, 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 think, uh, I think President Trump has, has fought hard. He's not, a, he's not one who gives in 
easily. He's, uh, you know, he's he's uh, he, he's a he's a very strong personality, and uh, um, I think I think it's appropriate to give him the time and his team time to come around. Um, but uh, when they do come around, um, I I don't think anybody. Uh, should should necessarily expect that it it won't be a professional transition, um, and and people should be aware that the transition isn't you know isn't just one man to another. It's it's a whole government, and there are, there are a lot of very capable professional people and good public servants serving in government today who uh, who I know. Uh, when the time comes, we'll want to do the right thing and um, and have a have a professional and dignified transition to the next administration. Thank you. I think it's important to distinguish between the White House and the agencies, and even within the White House, the White House itself and the executive office of the president. The White House is emptied out. You know, the ever all the offices and the West Wing. Literally at the inauguration, they pull up the carpet, they put down a new carpet, they paint, you walk in, and it's like an unoccupied space. It's a little bit um, uh, of an out of body experience, the beginning of an administration, to walk into the nerve center of the United States government and have it be like no one had ever been there. You walk across the street to the old executive office building, and there's hundreds of people who work for the National Security Council and the OMB. Office of Management and Budget for career staff who will work for the outgoing president and the incoming president with equal loyalty and determination. Um, the question is how you bring those teams together so that the new political team can take over in a smooth way. And I think the career people will do what career people do. They will be ready to perform the, the, the functions they perform and provide the information they provide and um, I, I agree with Josh that the, you know, no matter what the moment feels like, when the switch is thrown and we're universally in the place of embracing transition, things will get back into gear. Uh, and you know, the, the, the policy is one piece of it. The personnel is a whole other piece of it. That's presumably going on full speed ahead right now in the Biden transition office. You know, where the government run apparatus is in place to help them do the hiring. So, you know, I, I, I think when you add to that the fact that both Pre President elect Biden and many of the people around him have vast experience in government, they could, if they had to, sit down and draw a map of the West Wing and could decide where everyone sits without a briefing. It's not, it's not as if they haven't been there and it's not that hard to remember. So I actually think it's going to work out. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, what does the country and the world see? And is it reinforcing or, or, or undermining faith in uh, democracy and orderly government? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I hope that we get to, through this period with the answer being, uh, in the end, uh, it's another orderly transition that's seen that. So we have, well, thank you. Uh, really interesting perspectives. And of course, you know, what happens in the next two months is going to matter a lot for COVID and for our economy, uh, just enormously important. So, uh, I, I mean, there's some hope, I, I think, should we think there could be a phase four recovery bill? I mean, it's, uh, for example, in this period, can you imagine that kind of proactivity or, uh, or do you think that's, that's really at this point, um, uh, unlikely to, 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 to be able to move forward? Well, I can answer unambiguously what I think is the best thing for the country. Um, I, I've thought for months now that uh, every day we wait is waiting a day too long and it's gonna slow down the recovery and diminish uh, the ability of the economy to bounce back and cause a lot of unnecessary pain uh, if we wait. Um, I think it's a political question of whether it can come together. Um, I see many scenarios where you could come together this year. 
you know, mm -hmm. wasn't that many, uh, there weren't very many issues sort of separating, you know, Secretary Mnuchin and Speaker Pelosi just 10 days ago. Um, obviously, the circumstances have changed. If you start from there and do some adding and subtracting, um, is there a majority in Congress that would support doing something? I believe so. Um, and there will be political calculations made of if we do it now, is it better for us or worse for us next year? Ultimately, I think that it's going to fall to the leaders to decide, are we going to step up and do something that's in the best interest of the country and deal with the politics next year? Um, mm -hmm. Is there going to be a partner in the administration? Will they be actively engaged? Are they going to be disengaging from this moment forward? You know, it's a little ironic if on the one hand, you're denying that the outcome is clear to pre expect disengagement you know, when most administrations hold on to the last minute. I think they'll remain engaged, certainly at the level of the, of the agencies and the people who do the work. So I'm an optimist. I actually think there's, there's a reasonable um, uh, likelihood that something comes together this year. Will it be everything Democrats want? No. Will it be more than a lot of Republicans in the Senate want? Yes. If they can't come to some space that leaves everybody with a little less than what they wanted, but better than doing nothing, they won't be in agreement. Mm -hmm. So, so can, Josh, I, can I throw can... in a can I throw in a welcome note of pessimism? <laughs> First, I I completely agree with Jack on the on the importance of, of getting the the relief out there um, and. Uh, in my day job at the Business Roundtable, we've, we've strongly put our, our weight behind that. Uh, not because there's money in there for the, the CEOs of America's big corporations, there isn't, uh, but because there's, uh, but because the uh, America's great corporations need, need customers, they need employees, they need suppliers who are, who are supported through what hopefully will be only a few more months of this crisis, but could be quite a bit longer. My note of pessimism is that um, I think it's uh, um, I, I think it's actually helpful the prospect of a Republican Congress toward reaching an accommodation because if we were in a situation where Democrats had clearly held um, or had had clearly had a sweep. Republicans probably would not have been in much of a mood to compromise over the next two months. And Democrats would be inclined to wait for when they've got, uh, they've got their hands on all of the levers of power and can do what they want in the legislation. So uh, it's helpful, I think, to reaching an accommodation that I, I agree with Jack really has to be an accommodation uh, between the House and the Senate um, between Leader McConnell and Speaker Pelosi, uh, but there's enough ambiguity about um, control of the Senate now that uh, that both of them may feel like they're they're advantaged by waiting, and so uh, um, I fear that the political dynamics um, may not prove all that much more helpful over the course of the next month than they have over the course of the preceding six. That's I wish good. I could say I strongly disagreed with that. That is my fear. Yeah. Um, well, thinking about that Republican Senate um, possibility, um, Jack, let me ask you a, a political question. If, if, do you think having that uh, outcome of a, a split is going to constrain uh, President-elect Biden in his own cabinet selection as he tries to manage the kind of immense pressures from uh, you know, his own party, the progressive left and the need to reach across the aisle? Do you think that's gonna you know, result in you know, some thoughtful efforts to try to not only reach across the aisle as he's already indicated his desire to, but also create a cabinet that, that facilitates that? Well, it's not just something he said in the last couple of days. It's the way Joe Biden has lived his very long life in public office. Um, I can't tell you how many times I sat next to him in negotiations with Republican leaders, with Leader McConnell, and um, there was never the hint of anything other than constructive engagement to try to get things done. He never viewed the other side as the enemy. This is not just a, a, a 
latent uh, career awakening. Um, you know, I think presidents usually get most of their cabinet. I think he's going to be free to choose. There might be some individual who strikes a particular chord that is held up. My experience uh, with the Republican Senate was it was Democratic objections as much as Republican objections that made uh, confirmations challenging. It wasn't necessarily partisan in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, he'd be well advised to have a diverse cabinet that speaks to the need to bring the country together, to heal the country. Um, it's a moment of crisis. I hope it's also an experienced group because mm -hmm. it makes a difference if there are people who have done it before who know what they're doing. Um, I think it's going to be a question of, of getting the, the balance right. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no question that having a divided um, uh, Congress uh, means he can't just come in and you know, enact his whole campaign platform. You know, the dirty secret is that if it had been, if it's 50-50, there's a few Democrats that it's hard to bring over on his whole platform. It would have still been a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, the question is going to be, is there a willingness to work on a bipartisan basis? And, you know, we've seen moments of that in the last 25 years, and we've seen uh, years uh, when that wasn't the case. Um, if there's any willingness to work across party lines, I think there's yeah, you know, there's a almost universal acceptance of a need for a big infrastructure investment. You know, shame on us if we can't figure out a way to do it that both parties can vote for. You know, if if um, there's there's an issue like immigration reform, if that had been put up to a vote in the Senate, there was bipartisan agreement on immigration reform. You know, all these issues divide caucuses apart. Leaders have to be willing to put up for a vote issues that sometimes have some of their own party unhappy. You know, when President George H.W. Bush put the camp, the, the, the Andrews Air Force Base budget agreement up, it lost the first time. It had to come back for a second round. It's probably one of the most important pieces of legislation enacted in the last 50 years in terms of fiscal policy. And, you know, uh, so you can do things if you're willing to take on your own side. What we need, frankly, is leaders who are willing to take some risk, some risk that their members will grouse at them and maybe vote against them someday. Um, and some risk that their majority is gonna be a little harder to protect. You know, I grew up in a slightly older tradition under Speaker O'Neill, where one of the things that he made clear to me, it's not worth having the majority if you don't govern well. And, um, the Reagan administration beat our pants off, but he let them get their vote. Well, thank you. I, I, I'd like to sort of ask the same question to, to, uh, to Josh. I mean, here we are in a, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a global health crisis uh, and an economic crisis. It would seem a moment when, uh, when, when the nation is calling needs uh, the parties to come together uh, for action. Uh, and you are seeing uh, both Republican and Democratic um, uh, members. Uh, what is your sense of the willingness to work towards compromise among Republicans? I think you're on mute. Thank you. I, I think the willingness is pretty high. Um, I agree with I agree with Jack. It's uh, it really is in the hands of the leadership to take some risks. Um, the very often the uh, in fact most commonly the less risky thing to do is is nothing and uh, this is a moment that calls for something and, yeah um, and so I uh, I I think with uh, with with the right attitude from leadership and you know in in each of the corners. Um, I'm, I'm thinking now of the of the post inaugural period. Uh, I I think there will be a lot of a lot of cooperation, uh, just as there was in the period uh, in the first months of the Obama administration, where there was a lot of disagreement, um, but there was still a recognition that the U.S. was uh, just emerging from a uh, from its most serious financial crisis since the Great Depression. 
uh, and uh, and there was ultimately a willingness to come around behind sensible measures. Um, so uh, I'm I'm having having been the voice of pessimism uh, on the on the period during the in the transition period. I I I, I share the voice of optimism about. Uh, what the country might see in the early months of a Biden administration in terms of bipartisan cooperation to get the uh, to get the pandemic under control, uh, and uh, I'm hopeful about bipartisan cooperation on things like infrastructure that Jack mentioned. Well, thank you, uh, and and really that gets me to another um, uh, dimension, which is. How much time is there really for a new administration to put forward its agenda? <coughs> I think the president-elect has already indicated that um, he'll be ready day one and has indicated already areas of priority, whether it's uh, COVID or economic recovery, racial equity, climate change have already been identified. But one might imagine that he needs to walk in with that legislative package pretty prepared uh, at least conceptualized, and um, and yet you don't have all the information uh, until you're in office. So I wonder, Jack, if you could speak to that. How um, how much time is there uh, to develop and launch um, as of January twentieth? I, I I think the Obama administration was signing executive orders within days. Yeah, I, I was going to say that if you're talking about executive orders, there is time to put together a, a limited number of significant policy statements. And it doesn't take that long to draft an executive order that goes back into the Paris Climate Accord. It doesn't take that much time to draft the document to re-affiliate uh, uh, with the World Health Organization. There are some pretty basic things that are dramatic returns to what is a normal and broadly bipartisan approach. What's more complicated is doing new policy. Um, you know, so reversing some things you'll do right away. If you wanna put new regulations in place to deal with whether it's a climate issue or a safety issue, that's gonna take longer than the period. You can go back to something that was pre-existed. So if there was something an Obama policy that was eliminated, you can, you, know, you can go back to that policy, but it's still taking a little risk that you're relying on an old record. And you know, that, that's, you know, you're, you're probably gonna wanna look at what you're doing to withstand legal challenge. So I think you have to you know, have a day one agenda, a first three months agenda, a first six months agenda, even on the administrative side. On the legislative side, you know, I've had this discussion with some lawmakers who had the notion that, you know, if Joe Biden were elected, he could be inaugurated on January 20th and have a complicated legislative package enacted by January 31st. And I cautioned them to, you know, just no matter how good he and his team are, by January 31st, there could be empty offices in the West Wing, computers won't all be working, it's like asking a lot to write a big omnibus piece of legislation. And um, you know, I, I think in some ways, the fact that there's now a lame duck, which has a different setup because of the outcome of the election, because we don't know for sure what the balance of power is, but it certainly starts out as divided government. Um, it's a case that all the parties are going to have to work together if they want to do anything. And it, it will have to circumscribe a little bit the scope. Um, but it is possible, you know, it is possible to do something to respond to COVID, to have a recovery package in a pretty short order. Um, you know, I, I, I think the end of January is still pretty ambitious. <laughs> mm -hmm. Josh, would you care to comment on that as well? Yeah, the end of January is pretty ambitious. And, and, by, and by the way, I don't think it's necessary. Um, it's probably good that legislation takes time um, because uh, it's complicated stuff and it's hard to undo if you make a mistake. So um, I'm, I, 
I'm not one who, who, who thinks it's essential that the president be able to push through his agenda. Uh, I'm also, and, and but to, to, to go back to your original point, Merritt, I, I think it, uh, a president does need to come in with a governing agenda, with an idea of what they want to do. President Obama certainly did. Uh, President Bush did as well. I mean, we had a, we had a thick campaign book that we published of campaign speeches uh, divided by policy with the fact sheets that went with them. And when, when people outside and within our own government said, so, you know, what do you want to do? We handed them a copy of the book. And, and the job of the, uh, of the leadership in the White House wasn't to try to make up new policies. It was, uh, okay, what order are we going to do these things, try to do these things in? Uh, and uh, so I, I think the Biden administration comes in similarly with a book and they, they need to decide what order to do them in. And though I think the early months of a, of a Biden administration are likely to be uh, among the most important. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not one of those who believes that you're all that deeply constrained by the clock. You, you can legislate uh, even in even numbered years. I mean, they, Washington does not go to sleep. Jack, Jack will recall from his experience that the even numbered years were just as hard and active as the odd numbered years. Um, so uh, they, you know, there, there, there's, there's legitimacy to the point that, yep, put the stuff that you really need to and want to get done early in the agenda because you you start to run out of ammunition as you go along. But I, it's not a hard and fast rule, and I don't I don't think people ought to be bound by it. I think at a moment of such divisive politics, we have to also think about rebuilding confidence and building some confidence building measures along the way um, would be a good thing. So I'm a big advocate of starting with the things that you have to do and you mostly agree on and don't stop there. Use it as a way to try to do more. Well, well, thank you. Um, you know, we'll open it up for questions in just a couple minutes, but let me also ask you, you've had, both of you have had the unique role of being uh, the chief of staff. And, and, and I wonder if you could comment on what you think, how does a well-run White House operate? What are the key attributes of a well-run White House and what's the role of the chief of staff in facilitating uh, the creation of a well-run White House. Josh, you preceded me, so I'll let you go first. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, you, you know what the you know what the real secret to a well-run White House is? A, a boss who wants it to be well-run, and uh, and in in my case, that's where that's where it started. George George W. Bush. Uh, liked an orderly process, um, and he, uh, despite having a reputation as as the decider, uh, he he liked empowering people below him to do their jobs properly, which is exactly what he did for me and my predecessor Andy Card, who was a superb chief of staff as well, uh, as well as Jack. I'm not as not as well as me. Um, you let me add you. <laughs> uh, but uh, he empowered us, and and that's what that that's where a well-run White House begins, which is the president saying, um, "I want my White House to be organized. I want it to be disciplined, and I'm empowering my chief of staff to uh, to run a fair process." And and but that's the other element, which is that. Discipline breaks down principally when people don't think the process is fair. And so uh, from a chief of staff standpoint, um, and I, I know Jack was scrupulous about this, um, as, as, were, uh, as, as were most of our predecessors and successors, um, the, uh, the, the chief of staff has to, has to run a fair process and make sure that those who have a legitimate voice that the, 
that the president needs to hear from on a particular issue, get their voice heard. And if they feel like they get a fair shot at the president in, a, in, in the right context, uh, in, in almost all cases, they'll, re, they'll respect a disciplined process. Yeah, I... I, um, I Jack? think I just got disconnected. I'm trying to get no, back. No, you're here. We hear you. Okay. Um, you know, I 100% I agree that it, it starts with the president. Um, uh, a president who makes decisions uh, with the person he happens to be with uh, is very different from a president who demands that things come to him or her through a process where all voices have been heard and he or she gets to hear, see all sides. Um, you can't manage around the president. The president is the White House. Um, the chief of staff um, uh, at different points in the process plays different roles. I was chief of staff in an election year when the president was physically away campaigning three, four days a week. And um, my challenge was to make sure we could keep making hard decisions where everyone felt their point of view was being taken into account. Even if they didn't get the face-to-face -face meeting, they might usually get. And, um, and it was important for the president to make clear to people that he knew what they thought so that that process was self-reinforcing so that it didn't, the process didn't have to jam up based on could we get a meeting? Because the answer was in 2012, you probably couldn't get a meeting. And um, you know, in a normal year, in a normal time, um, how you use the president's time, how many people he or she gets to see, um, is a big factor in people buying into the process. There's no substitute for someone being in the room, hearing their point of view presented to the president. The president makes a decision. They've got nowhere to go to say that they weren't heard out. Um, and in a good White House, in a good operation, it doesn't have to be a White House, a team comes together behind a decision. If people have moral problems with an outcome, you can resign and protest. But most things don't come to that. Most things are a question was, did, did I get to be heard? And um, you know, I, I considered it actually equally important that people viewed the chiefs of staff office as a place where they would air any of their concerns so that the president wouldn't get kind of out of left field, something that other people hadn't had a chance to think about and process. Um, so it kind of goes both ways. You have to be heard, but others have to hear you. And it has to go to the president in an orderly way. I mean, when we had, you know, there's a tradition in many departments, many positions of, you know, formers having a, a meeting or a meal with an incoming. And um, I remember that conversation we had with the incoming chief of staff, where we told, you know, the same kinds of things that we're saying here. And, you know, it must have not fit with the personality of the incoming president. And in fact, the experience of chiefs of staff in this administration have reflected that. Um, but presidents get what they want. Um, if they want to make decisions themselves, they get to make decisions themselves. And a chief of staff can't correct that. Mm -hmm. But uh, one imagines that, uh, you know, that as a chief of staff, a White House chief of staff, you know, you can play in a, a really crucial role in, um, in, in identifying the types of issues that become presidential. I mean, you wanna keep things that don't feel of a presidential nature away from uh, the president. And of course, that must be a learning process. Um, and uh, so uh, the incoming is gonna to have to sort that out and figure out how to get, of course, as you say, this is a very experienced group, but I wonder if you have any comments, Josh, I think you've spoken to this issue a bit publicly on how you think about what is a presidential issue in creating a process. And of course you work for a president who liked to make decisions himself and reportedly uh, like to hear alternative viewpoints as well. Um, I wonder if you might comment on that. Yeah, President Bush did. Uh, but um, I think for, if for any president, a, an important role of the chief of staff is to do the sort as to what, what's a presidential decision and what isn't. 
I don't, uh, my, Jack's experience may have been different, but I don't recall ever telling a cabinet officer or an assistant to the president that they, they couldn't be heard by the president. I did tell cabinet officers that my advice to the president would be, uh, my advice that I would, I would give them advice that this is not a presidential level decision. Let's try to resolve it below the president and if necessary at the chief of staff's table uh, but maybe through the National Security Council, through the Domestic Policy Council, through the National Economic Council, there, there are fora where we can, we can hash these things out. And my advice is that we not take this to the president, but I will take it to the president if you ask, but I will also tell the president that I told him that I didn't think this warranted his attention. And if he agrees, he's going to be pretty damn mad at you. <laughs> and I never, I never had a cabinet officer push beyond that. Uh, and they, you know, they, they agreed to the sort. If it is a presidential issue, then the chief of staff's job is to, is to do exactly what Jack was talking about, which is make sure that it's been Prop, the arguments have been properly aired and sorted out below the president so that when it gets to the president, it's a coherent conversation uh, with sides reasonably well lined up and, and presented in a way that you make it possible for the president to make a, you know, a reasoned decision. It's, it, and it's probably not an easy decision if it got all the way to the president. The pre president doesn't get to make any easy decisions. Those, those happen below. But the, uh, the last point I make is that the, the interesting thing about the role I had was that I found that, you know, once we'd gotten everybody together uh, in, and the arguments together in front of the president, and Bush in particular loved, you know, he really wanted to hear the disagreeing points of view, um, and he wanted to sort them out and, and uh and, and take on the tough decisions. He liked that part of being president. Um, I often found that my role in that process was to provoke disagreement because a weird thing happens even when, when alpha cabinet officers walk into the Oval Office, they kind of take the edge off uh, either I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it could happen. One of them is that they feel bad that they're dumping a tough decision on the president's plate, uh, but that's what the president is there for. And so I often found that my role was to provoke them into being as sharp in their disagreement in front of the president as they had been outside of his hearing, because I, I think that's the way you really respect the president and his authority. You know, having worked for two presidents um, and having seen how two very smart and detail-oriented people can have different styles, it's just interesting for me to observe that you know, President Clinton had the patience in some ways to hear the same argument made five times. You'd go around and everyone, President Obama had every bit as much interest in hearing all the arguments but if you were saying the same thing as the person before you, all you had to say was, I agree with A. I, you didn't have to take five or 10 minutes. He wanted to hear the different views. And um, there is a tendency when people are in the room to want to talk and, uh, and they don't just like to say me too. So with you know, different presidents, you have to structure how it's presented in a way where they hear where everyone is in, in a way where it doesn't test their patience. Um, uh, and in the end, they have to make the hard decision. You know, uh, what Josh said about the easy and the hard decisions could not be more true. You know, it, it, it is, you, you learn it your first days as chief of staff, that the things you walk into the Oval Office uh, with are usually nasty, hard things. Something bad happened somewhere in the United States or around the world. There's a fight that can't get resolved between members of Congress and the administration. It's not everything's going great and our plan is going through. You know, all you need to do is say, you know, go. Um, that stuff happens on its own. Yeah, and uh, and you have to set a kind of a budget, as it were, for which bad issue warrants his attention, which hard decision warrants his attention, because by the end of the day. 
you've had a lot of them as president of the United States, and you got to make sure the most important ones get to him in a timely way. Well, thank you very much. I think if you don't mind, we'll turn to a few of the questions. We have several hundred people with us today, and I thank you all for joining us. And I'm seeing a variety of questions, some very specific, some very broad. Um, a couple have been uh, aimed at the question of how important is it that the General Services Administration Administrator is refusing to sign the letter allowing uh, the Biden team to begin its work. Uh, is that a significant matter or you know, we won't be hearing about that next week? Would either of you wish to comment on that? Jack, I'll, 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 I'll take the first one because I'm, I'm on the advisory committee of a group that, uh, that uh, a nonpartisan group called the uh, Partnership for Public Service, which is, a, which is a great group that Jack knows well and has, has collaborated with many times. Um, but there, we, we sent a letter to, uh, uh, to the administration saying it's time uh, now that the result is clear, it's time for the, the head of the GSA to uh, do what's called ascertainment, which is uh, the, the GSA administrator is in the weird position of determining whether it, whether the, uh, the next, whoever is going to be president is clear for purposes of making the making a variety of government resources available to um, that candidate's transition team, the most and, and this is a, largely a product of the 2010 legislation. But the important element uh, now is that um, the uh, the transition team, the, those landing teams that Jack was talking about at the outset. They don't have the right to go in and, and they don't get the invitation to go in until the GSA administrator has done this, uh, this ascertainment. So uh, it's, um, uh, it's an important step. I, candidly, I, I don't think it's a critical step today or tomorrow, something like that. Jack, Jack's right about the Biden team. They, there's a lot of this work they can do without getting access into the in, into the administration, um, but they ought to get it, and they it, uh, and they ought to get it relatively soon because there's a lot of important work to be done. There's a lot of important handing off to be done, especially in those areas where the country is currently in crisis, namely the uh, the economy and especially the, uh, the pandemic crisis. So, uh, yeah, it's important. It, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a three alarm fire today, but if we were still talking about it uh, as the electoral college is preparing to vote, I, I think that would be a big mistake all around. Uh, I agree hundred percent, the sooner the better, but um, it's not a disabling um, delay if it gets resolved quickly. Um, I actually think that it has more of an impact in terms of the, the kind of strength of our system than on the quality of the transition. It, it's unseemly for there to be a squabble about, uh, about orderly transition. So I hope it's resolved quickly. And mm -hmm. it does become a problem if it gets into December. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, thank you. So one uh, question we have received is, is really trying to say, you know, when does the president elect begin to receive security briefings? Um, that, that give him the same information that's provided to, to the current, uh, the, the sitting president. Um, is that dependent on what we've just been talking about or, or is that automatically uh, begin at a certain point? Well, in fact, the tradition is to offer it to candidates uh, to get security briefings even during the campaign. Um, so it can be done by the authorization of the current president and the Intel community, uh, you know, doing it. It's not exactly the same during the campaign, but the idea is that one of the two people who's gonna be president of the United States ought to have situational awareness of major things. Um, that gets more detailed as soon as it's clear who the president elect is and the president elect chooses to participate in, in briefings. Um, 
you know, again, I think the sooner the better, um, but the people around President-elect Biden um, are some of the people who used to produce those briefings, who have remained current in the, in the world of policy and intelligence. Um, I don't think it's zero or 100%. I mean, he has got the capacity to be briefed um, without the, the, the formal presidential daily brief. Would it, would it be good if he gets more sooner? Yes. There's a difference between current intel and general knowledge and partial intel. Mm -hmm. The thing about intelligence briefings that you learn after a while is there's very rarely a moment where it is the decisive piece of information where, where uh, you know what you need to do. It's an accumulation of data points. It gives you a context to make a nuanced decision weighing you know, an awful lot of considerations. And getting that into your head on a current basis sooner rather than later is a good thing, especially with so many troubled spots in the world. I'm, so I'm in, I think, Merritt, I think that's the best description of intelligence briefings I've ever heard. So <laughs> thank, thank you for putting it in context, Jack, because I, I think a lot of people, even sophisticated people outside of government do get the impression that uh, the intelligence briefer walks in and says, uh, Al Qaeda is about to attack the World Trade Center and, and uh, you know, we need to do something about it. You, you, it's, it's much more ambiguous and nuanced than that. And uh, its utility does come in setting context rather than in, uh, in, in driving a particular piece of knowledge um, on which action is required immediately. Mm -hmm. So we've already heard today that um, uh, the president-elect is, is creating a, a COVID uh, working group, a high-level group. Um, would it be, uh, is it possible for them to interact, for example, with Dr. Fauci and others uh, uh, under current conditions? I mean, here, you might imagine that that kind of technical expertise, uh, you, you know, should be informing uh, some of the early planning uh, going forward. Is that possible or is that being held up until these procedural steps are crossed? I can't imagine that there aren't a number of members of, Vice, of President elect Biden's team that don't talk to Dr. Fauci regularly. They've been colleagues for half a century and they're friends. So I assume there's an informal exchange of information going on and that it's not new. It would take an extreme act to prevent the informal conversation that's probably been, been going on for a professional lifetime between some of the uh, president-elect's uh, senior advisors and key people inside government like Dr. Fauci. And I, I don't anticipate that. It, uh, it'll be better when they're able to do it in a, in a more formal setting, but I, uh, I don't think the, uh, uh, I don't think people should uh, be under the misimpression that there, there aren't important conversations going on right now. Well, thank you very much. I think in our uh, remaining couple of minutes, could I just invite each of you to offer, uh, to share with us, and it's, it is truly a privilege to hear from both of you. And I thank you for being with us. What is your best advice to the incoming uh, uh, administration, the president-elect, on how to set up his operation in these days uh, to best, um, uh, you know, move forward? Um, I'm not asking you to speak to the content so much of the policies, although you're welcome to if you wish, but just thinking of, uh, and would love to have a subsequent conversation um, on, on, on policy. Uh, itself, but just thinking as 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 people who've managed uh, the complexity of information coming in, the necessity of pulling together a budget and a legislative process, what is your best advice on how to set priorities now and uh, for the groundwork for success? Josh, would you like to get us started? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I think the most important thing is, seems to be well underway in, uh, as reflected in, in uh, Vice President Biden's remarks on Saturday evening, which is to set the right tone 
um, to set a unity tone, to set a set a tone of uh, of outreach and as much as possible bipartisan cooperation. I, th I think that will, I, um, I'm hopeful that he and his team will sustain that. And I think that, that, will, that will go a long way to getting him off on the right foot. Uh, gen more generic advice is, uh, uh, includes elements like, uh, as you set up your administration, start with the White House. Um, because that's uh, that's the that's the organ that's going to help the president make the most important decisions, and uh, it was uh, it, it it was a it was a rule that the Clinton administration breached, I think, to its to its disadvantage, but that the Obama administration took on board, and they came in with a well organized, um, uh, effective White House on on day one. The other, the other piece of generic advice I would, I would pass along is um, make sure lines of uh, communication and decision-making authority are clear. I, I'd emphasize what both Jack and I were talking about in the role of the chief of staff, which is to be clear about how decisions will be made by the White House and which through which channel a, uh, a policy discussion and disagreement needs needs to arrive on the president's desk because a, a lot of new administrations, um, because the roads are not well worn at the outset, um, make mistakes um, of, that are born of, of poor process uh, about how decisions need to come before the president. And, and I think uh, emphasizing those and being clear about those from the beginning is important. I think it'll be especially important for um, for President Biden because uh, he he more than most elected presidents uh, has a pretty broad spectrum of views uh, in his own party that he needs to reconcile. Um, as he as he pursues his governing agenda, and so the temptation will be to be, to appoint a czar for this that is the representative of the progressive wing, and the you know the assistant to the president for that that will represent the the more moderate wing of the party and so on. Um, and I my own view is that to the extent an incoming president Biden can resist that, he will be. Uh, and, and keep clarity about the decision-making process within his White House, he'll be greatly advantaged. Thank you. You know, coming uh, into office at a moment of health and economic crisis, um, it will be easy for the new team to get all consumed with the immediate uh, moment. And um, what they're really gonna need to do is put everything against that problem that it takes to address it, but have another team working on the other things that are coming up next, because time goes very fast. And um, you know, if you get a little momentum with an effective response to the health and economic crisis, you want to be able to then take the next step and have laid the groundwork. So you've got to be able to to multitask in the White House. Um, you know, hopefully it will be trying to do good things, but if something bad happens. One of the things that many of us has learned is you got to be able to, to you know, keep managing a problem in one place and managing the government in another place. You can't ever stop. Um, process is critical. Um, the point Josh was making about the competition between different factions in the Democratic Party. When a decision is made, it's going to be essential that all the factions feel that their views were taken into consideration. You know, it's not going to work if it's all either or. And that means that it's going to take some time and the time can't make it impossible to make decisions. So ultimately it has to be queued up for the president to make decisions. It shouldn't be at the expense of airing what is the impact of a, a, an economic policy on the environment? What is the impact of an environmental policy on the economy. 
you have to be able to look at both. And um, the, the openness, um, lines of communication have to be open within the White House, between the White House and Congress, and candidly across uh, party lines and uh, across constituencies. Um, coming out of this election, a successful first year of a Biden administration will have left the message that people are being heard whichever side, it wasn't just a speech you know, acknowledging uh, the election. It's a way of governing. Um, that would go a long way towards the healing if there's a sense that people are being heard. And that doesn't mean leaving behind the people who are at the core of your, your own constituency. Um, I think these are hard times to do that. Um, you know, we haven't, uh, we haven't had a rich tradition of being open uh, to disagreeing points of view. You know, with the conversation here, you know, we're showing our age. I mean, we're of, we're not that old, but we're of a different generation of, of political engagement. And frankly, we need a little more of that in the current and future generation, because if it's just a question of being pitted against each other, we're gonna have a series of transitions that are just a pendulum swinging from one way to the other. And that's really bad for the country. You need some long-term policy, uh, which I think the way this election has ended and the way President Biden is gonna be coming in and the career he's had makes him in some ways uniquely able to, to model a, a pathway on it. So it's a, a, a lot to put on anyone's shoulders, but it's a big job. Well, it, this has been an extraordinary conversation, uh, and I think uh, it's just been a privilege uh, to have it with both of you. I, I think the wisdom, the experience, the leadership uh, that you represent uh, is, uh, is, is just enormously valuable and uh, uh, quite uplifting at this moment to imagine we could go forward um, uh, with that experience uh, advising uh, both in Washington and outside. So thank you both so much for being with us, answering many questions from our audience and helping us better understand uh, how to govern from the White House. Thank you both very, very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Mary. Thank you.